Welcome one and all to Puppet History! Today we'll be taking an ever-winding look at yet another chapter in the heavy, heavy book we call history while our guests ruthlessly compete for the coveted title of History Master. I am obviously your beloved host, The Professor. A thank you. Ryan Bergara, are you ready? Jesus, a little more sauce than usual in that intro. Almost blew my ear yeah, out. deal with it! It's getting okay. saucy! Special returning guest and champion, Garrick Bernard, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Let's do it. <laughs> all right, let's crack it! Well, look, let's address this right out the gate. Garrick, you're looking a little less fuzzy than the last time we saw you. <laughs> Holy shit. This hurts. You can't just turn people into puppets without their consent. There was consent there. When you take a jelly bean, you accept the responsibilities of eating a, a magical jelly bean. Are you a human and you just keep on eating jelly beans? Or Holy are you just shit. a puppet? We don't need to. We don't need to dig even further on that lore. <laughs> uh, now, to begin, how many mistresses are you currently keeping? I plead the fifth. Excuse me. How many mistresses are you keeping, Professor? You know, I'm a freak back here. <laughs> yeah, you guys get pretty wet and wild. I got yeah, so many, oh, you know, offers as a puppet. Yeah. It was crazy. Yes. I hate every second of everything that's <laughs> happening right now. Well, with all the fraud emotions and betrayal involved, mistresses can be a dangerous business. Today's story is a perfect example, a tale full of mistresses, betrayal, and danger. We're learning about the affair of the poisons. That sounds like a band that Shane Madea would like. I listened to Affair of the Poisons. I heard them before anyone else. You guys stop talking about this guy on this show. I've never even met this dude. <laughs> <laughs> this feels personal. If there was ever a major league for mistresses, it was arguably the 17th century French aristocracy under the Sun King himself, King Louis XIV. By the late 1670s, France under Louis was really hitting its stride. The army was powerful, the aristocracy was rich, the arts were bumping, and science was, well, it was uh, coming along. And while being rich and powerful is usually a pretty sweet deal, being a part of Louis XIV's aristocracy was even sweeter. And one Marie Madeleine Marguerite d'Aubray wanted in. Now, Dabre was the eldest daughter of a highly respected magistrate, but highly respected did not equal royal. To get there in 1651, Mary Madeleine Marguerite married Antoine Gobelin, uh, Tony Goblin, <laughs> the Marquis de Brinvilliers, and Baron de Norar. That sounds like the, the Halloween version of Tony Robbins. Tony Goblins or something. <laughs> I mean, technically, he's Antoine Gobelin, but... Uh, colloquially <laughs> Tony Goblins. Antoine wasn't exactly a catch. Described as, quote, a man without morals, weak as water, and unstable as sand. Not very complimentary. They hate this guy. But the marriage meant making the jump to the official aristocracy, and that's a hard deal to pass up. Plus, it wasn't like getting married meant she couldn't find a sweet little side piece, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Marie Madeleine Marguerite, now the Marquise de Brinvilliers, began an extramarital relationship with a hunky Ooh. army officer <laughs> named Godon de Saint Sanqua. Was that too much mustard? No. Go down to Sanqua! Professor, I believe the term nowadays is not extramarital. It's actually called entanglement. Oh, is it? It's first said on the red table talk. Yeah. Oh, yes. News of the affair started to become public knowledge, and Madame de Brinvilliers family started to worry about the possible damage to their reputation. They asked her to break off her affair, and when she refused, her father used his position to have Sanqua arrested and thrown in the Bastille for over a month. Month. Wait, Bastille's actually a word besides being a shitty band? Ooh. It's a notorious prison. I like the name of that. Bastille. While in prison, Sanqua met a man named Egidio mm. Exili, who happened to be the world's foremost expert on poisons. <laughs> After they were released, Exili showed Sanqua the ins and outs of the poison game, and Sanqua soon became quite the accomplished death mm. chemist himself. De Brinvilliers, whose infatuation with saint Croix was not at all deterred by her hot boyfriend's prison record, learned how to make poisons herself and began testing them out. We have so many band names in this. Death Chemist? Yeah. God damn, yeah, that's a that's sick good. ass band. That's better than Heisenberg. Yeah, it is. Question time! How did she test the poisons? A. On herself. B. On her neighbor's dogs. Or C. On her servants and patients at the public hospital. 
this is unfortunately the best dance. No, wait, nah, nah. I, I'm pretty sure it's, I'm gonna go B, uh, the, the poor dogs. I'm gonna say B as well. Oh, we got a couple B boys for poisoning dogs. We're gonna find out the answer via the magic of theater. I'll see you guys in a bit, bye. What was this girl's name again? I have no idea. I can't keep track of these names. It's like fucking Game of Thrones again. <laughs> Ah, good afternoon, my sick little friend. How are we feeling today? Oh, Marquise de Brevilliers. It's so kind of you noble women to come visit. We wretched sick here at the hospital. Oh my God. Jesus Christ. I'm feeling much better. The doctors here surely must be miracle workers. Well, I've no doubt they are. <laughs> Such great news. Hey, I've brought some wine to toast to your speedy recovery. Oh, wow, you Ugh. truly must be one of the nicest people in all of history. <laughs> yes, drink up. <laughs> aren't, aren't you going to have any? Um, no, no, I would, but um, uh, I, I drove here. <laughs> you did what? <laughs> just, just shut up and drink, you sick, silly belly. <clears throat> now I'm dead. Oh, wow, okay, that's a good one. Uh, okay, next room. Jesus Christ, man. God, That's fucked up. That took a hard left. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> what in the hell? <laughs> Everything's fine. Uh, points to neither of you. <laughs> what a... What a quirky lady, huh? Yeah, quirky, yeah, yeah, that's that's one way of putting it. As if being sick in the hospital wasn't bad enough, in Paris, you had the risk of being murdered by the rich ladies doing quote-unquote charity work. Once she had made some effective slaughter water, Debervilliers began putting it to use. Slaughter <laughs> water. Another yeah. band name. Or, or, the, or like a good energy drink slash malt liquor. Can you pick me up a pack of slaughter waters? I'm trying to get fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, another one! Hey, who did Deborah Villiers kill with poison? A, her deadbeat husband. B, her dad and brothers. What? Or C, the king's mistress. What the fuck? Yeah, she's getting the work. Uh, 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 B, family. She, uh, family's dead. She killed their family. I love the enthusiasm. Thanks, man. Hey, she killed her deadbeat husband because that's a thing in France. A point to Ryan! Yeah. Damn. She's a cartoon villain at this point. Yes, pissed at her lame dad for sending her hot, hot boyfriend to jail and wanting to inherit her family's fortune, De Brinvilliers straight up murdered her dad in 1666 and her brothers in 1670. What did the brothers do? Oh, because she wanted the inheritance. Slimy. Fair. Would you guys poison your whole family? Yeah, let me think about that. No. No. Would you? Do you have a family? Or d did you have a family? D did you have a family? Papa, I want a jelly bean. I don't know. <laughs> Repressed memory. Oh God. That's even worse than I thought. Now you may be wondering, while carrying on this affair, why didn't she ever poison her husband? Well, she did. Frequently. She tried five or six times to poison him. Every time, though, her hot lover, San Qua, having no desire to actually marry the woman who was going around poisoning innocent people, gave the Marquis Whoa. the anti-poison. How come I don't get a point? I she he poisoned she poisoned him. Okay, you know what? He, you get a point. He just didn't die. Wait a second. Yeah. This isn't a goddamn <laughs> negotiation. No, no, no. But he asked very nicely, and he's not wearing a stupid orange hat, so I'm giving him a point. <laughs> can I can I have a point? No. Unshockingly, San Qua himself mysteriously died in 1672, likely while hunkily experimenting with his poisons. Upon investigating his death, police came across a trove of letters and other evidence showcasing De Brinvilliers' crimes. De Brinvilliers fled, but in 1675, she was discovered in a convent and brought back to France to stand trial. After a two and a half month long trial, during which she was not allowed an attorney, she was convicted and sentenced to death by beheading. That's hilarious because at the end of the day, you need the receipts, you need screenshots just in case Agreed. you go down too. I'd have detailed files and multiple yeah. copies. It's estimated 100,000 people showed up to watch her execution at 7 p.m. on July 17th, 1676. After all, this wasn't just some random scoundrel being put to death. This was a member of the nobility. Did you have to pay like extra to get in like the splash zone or something? Yeah, like the splash. <laughs> people up top in the nosebleeds with binox looking at that. They march her out and you just hear a very reverby Seven Nation Army playing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or Slaughter Water. That's the band of the time. Fucking slaughter yeah. Water, dude. Right before the axe fell, De Brinvilliers told the thronging crowd, What? 
A, that she wasn't Dayburn Villiers at all, but instead a genie. A puppet had apparently glued a wig to his head in the hopes of having the people of France put a stop to his chasing the puppet through time, but it doesn't work like that since the genie would just disappear at the moment of execution anyway. <laughs> B, that this was really unfair, since, like, everyone in Paris was poisoning people, too. Why should she be the only one to die? Or C, she was carrying King Louis XIV's child! I'm gonna go with a, a C, baby entrapment. That seems like the most... C, I'm baby. Go also with C, baby. C, I Whoa! Uh, looks like we got some C Don't. dogs out there! <laughs> uh, <laughs> I got a couple of C dogs. <laughs> Uh, we love it's one of our best bits on this show. It hasn't we'll worked it. since the first time you've said it. <laughs> Points to neither of you! The answer wow, was actually B. De Brevilliers said that half the town was guilty of the same crime, and if she named names, oh, they'd be in serious trouble. Uh, with that, her head was lopped off and her body was burned. As the throngs shuffled off to enjoy their Friday evening, one thing must have stuck in their mind. She wasn't serious about that half the town business. R right? The public's unease was rooted in the nature of poisons themselves. Not only were people defenseless against the tasteless and odorless toxins that were growing in popularity, but the chances of catching a poisoner were impossibly low. In the highly stratified French society, the otherwise powerless could easily, and without consequence, strike out against the powerful. Many men also feared this could be a long overdue comeuppance because, record scratch, women could now kill men. Hooray! It seems like they were poisoning people back then over minor inconveniences. Yeah, like, it's just like, oh, you you cut me in line? All right, man, I got Well, you. I got something for your ass right <laughs> yeah. here. Dinner's gonna be cold tonight, motherfucker. Why is there smoke coming off of my water? <laughs> it's fucking slaughter water, dude! <laughs> With Paris abuzz about poisonings and a member of his aristocracy now reduced to ashes for murdering her family, King Louis put his chief of police, Nicolas Gabriel de la Reine, in charge of sussing out rumors of more poisoners amongst the nobility. La Reine's first big break came in December of 1678, when a lawyer named Maitre Perron attended a dinner hosted by Marie Vigoro, a former wet nurse for the aristocracy turned fortune teller. Cool. Also in attendance was one Marie Bus. After the dinner, Perron notified the police that he suspected the women to be involved in poisoning. Oh, what made Perron think so? A. His food had a sharp metallic taste while the women's food did not. B. While in the bathroom, he found a secret compartment full of suspicious vials. Or C. Bus told him she poisoned people for a living. <laughs> That's funny. I got C. I'm about this poison life. I'm gonna say uh, B. I don't know if this is uh, the correct way or not, but uh, yeah, B. We got a little, uh, another little skit for you. Let's uh, be transported to another world, another time. I'll see you in a bit. That's generous. Woo, we had a lovely dinner party. Oh, hey, I'm sorry. What's your name again? I am Meta Perron. Wow, cool. Um... What, uh, what line of work are you in? I am an attorney. And you? Well, I used to be married to a horse dealer, but he's dead. And then I was in jail for counterfeiting for a spell. But now I'm in a different business. I'm, uh, selling inheritance powders, if you know what I mean. Inheritance powders. Yeah, uh, poisons and cousin. <laughs> business is a bowman. I'm thinking all I gotta do is poison three more people and I can retire. You heard me when I said I am a lawyer, right? Damn, this wine is delicious. Holy shit, this party rules. So she just told him? Could you imagine just casually being like, oh yeah, I murder people every now and right. then, not all the time, but. I, I'm sorry that I'm thinking more highly of the people in the 1600s. I thought they were smarter than that. Well, everybody needs a side hustle, I guess. <laughs> Point to Ryan. Nice, nice. Vigoro and Bus were arrested on January 4th, 1679, and they immediately started to sing, naming names of others playing the death-selling game. To get a sense of how big the underground poison economy had gotten, Vigoro claimed to know of at least 400 people peddling poisons and potions to the Parisian public. 400? Yeah, I don't even, there's not even 400 vape shops in Los Angeles. Oh, do you vape? Mm, eh, I put up some clouds. <laughs> put up some clouds? Right. I bet you you got a little vape pen in that stupid satchel of yours right now. Hang on, real quick, I gotta juice up real quick. Watch <laughs> 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 your entertainment does not approve of the professor's vaping habit in hopes that you'll keep in mind that he has a nasty little creep whose eye consists of spiders and possibly even
Many of these semi-professional chemists were sorcerers and fortune tellers who lived in the suburbs of Paris, selling love potions, beauty ointments, and magical rituals to the women of France. As Lorraine rounded up more and more people, a special commission was put in place to try all of the accused. The commission regularly authorized the use of two levels of torture to extract confessions. Ordinary torture, which, you know, ho-hum, so what? And, of course, extraordinary torture, which turned out to be eh, the same as the ordinary torture, just twice as bad. If they survived the tortures, which, for instance, Vigoro did not, the guilty could be put to death by decapitation, strangulation, hanging, being broken on the wheel, or being burned alive! The latter was Bus's fate. People may be bad now, sure, but they used to be worse. Did I hear you right in saying that w one of the options was strangulation? Is that where a guy is sitting in a chair and someone comes on stage and just just, just strangles him to death yeah. for like five minutes? Right. How is that different than hanging? Just a big scary guy. Just puts you in a chokehold like a Brock Lesnar type? Yeah, you would hope it'd be like a Brock Lesnar type because then you'd at least go quicker. But if you have a guy up there with like weak dexterity and small hands, you could be up there getting right. strangled for anywhere from 10 minutes to 30 maybe. And now to strangle you to death, bring out the dandy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks to all the torturing and the sheer number of people being subjected to it, accusations were flying everywhere for poisonings and practicing dark magic. I'm calling everybody a witch. You're a witch. <laughs> <laughs> you're a fucking witch, I swear to God, you're a witch. Thanks to Buzz's squealing, on March 12th, Lorraine arrested potion maker Catherine Monvoisant, also known as La Voisant. While Lorraine was by now shocked at the sheer number of people getting swooped up into his investigation, it was La Voisant's client list that showed him just how high up the scandal went. One name in particular stood out, the Marquise de Montespan. Oh, who was the Marquise de Montespan? A, the king's mistress. B, the king's sister. Or C, the king's poison taster. <laughs> uh, I'm, gonna, I just, I'm gonna put A, mistress, I don't know. Like, okay. I'm also gonna put A, this is a story about mistresses, right? All right, so. points to both of you. Hooray. Well, not only was the Marquise de Montespan the king's mistress, she was also the mother of seven of his legally legitimized children. She was a big deal, who spent a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with Louis XIV. So, what was she doing patronizing a shady poison vendor? Isn't the kind of the definition of a mistress is that they're kind of a secret? Right. There's seven kids running around. Not much of a secret to be had there. Mistresses back then obviously were sort of a, an accepted reality. It was like, well, that's the way men are. Nasty men. Nasty! Well, actually, in all of France, there was probably no position more sought after than King's mistress. Showered with riches and privileges and without the burdens of queenly obligations. It's good work if you can get it. And lots of women wanted to get it. Probably coming through a lot of resumes. It sounds like a sweet gig to me. I would do it. It does sound like a cool gig. Occasionally you gotta smooch an inbred ghoul. So what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you thought of it just as like a magical staff that you have to rub every now and then and you get rich, <laughs> yeah. it actually changes like the whole kind of like dynamic of it. When Madame de Montespan arrived at Louis XIV's court mm. in 1665 as a lady-in-waiting, the king's mistress was Louise de la Valliere. Montespan immediately set her sights on replacing la Valliere as mistress numero uno, with the strategy of putting herself in front of Louis XIV as much as possible. The plan worked, and by the summer of 1668, Montespan was pregnant with the king's child, much to the chagrin of, twist, her actual husband! Everybody's fucking each other. Do you think that they kind of like came together on this plan? They're like, look, that's what we're I'm not thinking. doing too well. The crops aren't watering. You might have to go fuck that old guy. Hey man, start an OnlyFans. We need to pay this rent. That does sound like the most amicable way about it, but uh, I think we're about to discover that it may not have been super amicable. Oh. Okay, well, maybe, not. maybe not. Sometimes we're wrong. That's right. Madame de Montespan was married to a rude and unambitious chump, Louis-Henri de Pardaillon de Gondron, the Marquis de Montespan. Upon hearing his wife had left him for the most powerful man on the planet, he tried unsuccessfully to get some sort of financial benefit from the situation. When that didn't work, in September of 1668, the Marquis had the stones to go to the freaking Sun King and demand his wife back. 
This obviously didn't work, and the king tossed the Marquis in prison, duh. After two weeks, he was let out and put under house arrest, only allowed to leave if the guy who was stupping his wife said so. Good Lord. That sucks, dude. <laughs> There's probably guards outside of his door and saying, hey, Get back inside while the king fucks your wife. You know? <laughs> hey, don't look out those windows while he's spanking that ass. They're like earmuffs, earmuffs. You better get some goddamn curtains. Once she had established herself in the role, Montespan thrived. She was called the king's second wife and the real queen of France. And she protected her position ruthlessly. Oh, when the king began taking up with a new woman, Mademoiselle de Fontage in 1679, how did Montespan react? A, she released a pair of her pet bears in Defontage's apartment to destroy the place. B, she had Defontage's father sentenced to toil 20 years in a ship's galley. Or C, she had a servant shave Defontage's head while she slept. Any one of these answers is straight up freaky. C is the funniest answer, but I do think it's B, strap that girl's daddy to a boat. Um, Garrick? I'm gonna go with C because okay. she's evil and she's trying to take away her looks. What would you say if I said points to neither of you? What? Bears? He has not just one pet bear, but two? They're dumb. Everybody doing this is stupid. Uh, they're openly talking about how they poison people. Um, yeah. They're saying, oh, well, everybody else does it. And then they're releasing bears. What does that help? Think of the logistics, too, of getting the bear over to that person's apartment. Did they walk right. it over or was it in a giant cage that they had to drag? It seems like a lot of work. Like I always say, if you've got the bears, why not use them? Which reminds me, Ryan, can you confirm to me your address is still a... Well, since we've seen how ruthless Montespan could be, it should be little surprise that her name came up when Lorraine was investigating the poison markets of Paris. After all, if you're using bears, you're probably also using more subtle methods as well. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. I mean, once you murder people by bear, pretty much open playing field then at that point. In July of 1680, Marie Lavoisin, the daughter of that lady with the thick list of poison clients, was brought in to give testimony about her mother's business as the commission had burned Lavoisin at the stake apparently before they'd asked all of their questions. With her mom dead, Marie didn't have too many qualms about spilling all the tea about her mom's most important customer. And baby, that tea was hot! Marie revealed that the king's mistress had been her mother's client for at least five years. At first, Montespan was only interested in rekindling the king's waning love with potions and spells, including some black masses, which were like Catholic masses, but for that funny, funny guy we all know and love, Satan. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds wacky. Marie testified that three or four newborn infants had been sacrificed in rituals meant to make the king like her more. Oh my God, kill her now. That's wild. We take a hard stance here <laughs> against killing children for devil things. <laughs> when murdering babies proved to be ineffective, Montespan flipped tactics and decided that if she couldn't have the king, no one could. She planned to have Lavoisin create poisoned clothing for both Louis and his new squeeze, Defontage. This plan, however, was never carried out. Talk about a killer fashion sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sure seems like everyone's come down with a case of poison fever. Yeah, people get into fads, like Tiger King and yeah. stuff like that, so it makes sense. He also tried to kill someone, so I mean, I guess it's the same vibe. If we didn't have streaming services and things to distract ourselves, we would probably just all kill each other, because that's what humans do. Yeah. Lorraine kept the king apprised of these revelations what? about the mother of seven of his kids. Oh, upon learning of his mistress's alleged shenanigans, how did King Louis react? Uh, what do you got, Ryan? I think he probably was like, wow, she really likes me. I didn't know she felt that way. And Garrick? I also said that he loved it and like promoted her somehow. I ain't never had buddy murder somebody for me. Man, I didn't realize this D was that good. Dude. Um, you know what? I guess I'll give a point to both of you because neither are totally correct, but they're also not wrong. So, uh, okay. <laughs> Incredibly, he made sure that Madame de Montespan never stood trial and that as few people as possible knew about her alleged involvement. It's unclear if Louis actually believed any of it. Sensing that the whole ordeal was getting a little out of hand, as well as striking a little too close to home, in 1682, the king disbanded the commission. He released an edict, putting tougher restrictions on poison, and to try and quell the public hysteria over the witchier parts of the trials, 
He officially stated that all, quote, diviners, magicians, and enchanters are imposters. Essentially, the king said, Calm down, y'all! Magic is fake! It sounds about right. Everybody's just like, oh, this is this is terrible until somebody close to me uh, did it or does yeah. it. Would you, would you guys be flattered if your significant other killed someone uh, to get you to like them more? It's just a question. Um, no, because I'm not an ego monster. <laughs> um, yes, because I am. Okay. <laughs> a point for Garrick. A point for Garrick yeah. for being honest. Yeah. Few seemed more glad to see the affair wrapping up than the judges of the special commission. By the time they were done, they had issued 319 arrest warrants, resulting in 194 actual arrests, with many of the rest fleeing Paris. 34 people were put to death, two others died while being tortured. Having never been charged with any crime, Madame de Montespan, say it with me, retired to a convent in Paris in 1691 where she lived until her death in 1707. That's a good life. Smooch a king for a while, narrowly yeah, escape yeah. death, become a nun, then die. That was a fucked up story. Um, I'm gonna check all of my food from now on, you know, make sure I make it. It would really suck to, have, like, every time I ate a meal, to be worried, hey, there might be poison in this. <laughs> yeah. I'm a pretty paranoid guy. I feel like that would drive me insane. Oh! Alright, well that concludes our history lesson. I'm going to go tally the scores of this impossibly low scoring episode to see who receives a Covenant Cup and the title of History Master! While I do that, please enjoy the special performance from, oh god, two murderous bottles of poison! I'm getting out of here! He's not counting anything. He's just gonna go back there and vape. Oh boy. Also kind of stuff. Don't you want to stick around because it's fun to do stuff? If only you could win yourself about your enemies. Well, if I got news for you, my friends are simple than it seems. You could talk it out and be real polite. polite. You could slap them with a cook in a fancy fight. fight. But if you want to keep receiving clean, clean and fast, I got a pitch ready for this. Uh -huh. Poison their ass. Take any recipe and a drop of me. Run all your focus meal with a fatality. Bottoms up, but uh oh, your time is too. When they take a little soup, bye bye, bye juice. Drop, drop. A toxic cocktail and it's in the split. Drop, drop, drop. Quick dessert for a premature end. Drop, drop. With a goblet and a couple drops more. Like it was Tuck bodies in the floor. Knock, knock. It's the landlord looking for rent. And now that arsenic you bought seems like money well spent. Drop, drop. Come on in. Grab a beer. Help yourself. Good luck evicting me when you're burning in hell. When you dance, it tells you you eat too many sweets. Or somebody at the movies like I'm saving these seats. Anybody on the road who doesn't know to use the blinker. Keep it up and get a taste of what I've been keeping in my teeth. Hey, let's say you got a list of people making you piss. <laughs> Have them over for some drinks. Say, see you in a mix. Clink, clink. Raise a glass. Here's to you, everyone. Just be sure to dig some grapes. You're gonna need them, son. The opinions expressed by the Bye Bye Brothers do not reflect the views or attitudes of Watcher Entertainment, its employees, or its many, many subsidiaries. If you have an issue with someone considering going out for hot dogs and talking out your issues like a reasonable person. Do not murder, do not poison. A toxic cocktail in the city is blend. Don't deserve quick dessert for a premature and something must be a power for toe in your ass. So you might be the next one sipping your last. We're the Bye Bye Brothers and we came to say if anybody asks you didn't see us here today, try to cut the petty murder when you're simply a mess. But there are several warrants out for our arrest. <laughs> odd. Very odd. I'm sorry, did he say if you didn't use your blinker, he would kill you? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't mind that. I, that is my number, is one of my bigger pet peeves. It's, it's uh, the most minimal of movements. You're just moving your finger and you're letting me know what you're gonna do. If you, can, if you can't do that, then you should die, probably. Oof. Yeah, tough take. Wow, what a lovely performance from the Bye Bye Brothers. If you ever cross paths with them, please contact the local authorities. Uh, anyway, uh, according to our complex victory algorithm, this week's history master is... Garrick! Oh, Garrick, go and fetch the Covenant Cup, which you have so rightly earned. Mm. Ah, it's up there. Classic, classic. <laughs> Another heist pulled off. For you. Yeah. Huh? Another heist, uh, right? Well, another little victory for you. Maybe have some respect, yeah. Little blue bitch. Oh, yeah. Wow, Garrick! Whoa! That's so exciting. Fresh uh, batch of jelly beans for you there. I know you yeah, love thanks, them. Yeah, thanks, man. I love them so yeah, much. Yeah. I'm gonna just. Well, just to remind. No, wait, wait, wait just to remind. You. Oh, no. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, no, God, God damn, damn it, not again. You fucking Why? monster. You did it again. I can, I can, can you please? I tried. Now, you, now, this time it's on you. Garrick, I apologize, but thanks again for coming. Ryan, no. thanks for trying. And to the rest of you, thank you for watching Puppet History, where the details are always a little fuzzy. <laughs> we'll see you next time, folks. Whoop. <laughs>